recording. Uh, welcome to class, guys. Uh, today we are finishing up chapter five, and uh, the terms here on the uh, title should be familiar. We've talked a lot about inverse functions back when we were talking about functions, and we also talked about um, radical functions, and especially their domains. And we saw that um, the domain can be sort of one of the more difficult um, aspects of um, radical functions. And today, we're going to sort of tie the two of them together and back to Chapter 5. So Chapter 5 has been all about polynomials, polynomial long division, um, and we've talked a little bit about rational functions as well. And we'll find that when we're trying to search for the inverses of polynomial functions, uh, that more often than not, they will be radical. And if we look for the inverse of a radical function, um, often they will be polynomial. But we must be really careful because we have to guarantee that our functions pass the horizontal line test and indeed or one-to-one -one before we start um, trying to find an equation for the inverse. Um, so for today, we've got two main um, objectives. And those objectives are first to find the inverse of an invertible polynomial. So that's this one. And the term invertible polynomial here just means that it passes the horizontal line test. So that, that way, when we actually flip it across the line y equals x and we replace y with x, we get something that passes the vertical line test and is actually a function. So invertible polynomial here means that you pass the horizontal line test. And we already know that there's lots and lots of functions, polynomial ones especially, that do not pass the horizontal line test. For example, if you have some turning points on your graph, then um, if you have a turning point, um, then you are definitely not going to pass um, the horizontal line test, okay? So here's just an example of something that has two turning points and doesn't pass the horizontal line test. And furthermore, if you have something whose leading coefficient is um, a degree that is an even power, then you already know that the end behavior is going to be everything going up or everything going down, and therefore, again, you won't pass the horizontal line test. In other words, um, a polynomial of even degree just will not have the property of being one-to-one. -one. And therefore, there won't be an actual inverse. So what we need to do is think more carefully about the domain. And in those instances, we'll restrict the domain. And when we restrict the domain, that'll allow us to then find an inverse of the function. So we'll talk about a couple of examples like that. But it's, um, I'll just warn you now that in infinity, I think there's maybe one or two questions and the vast majority of them focus on um, objective one. And we already have like most of the tools in order to find the inverse. So a lot of what we're going to be doing today is just a reminder of sort of old things, but in the context of polynomials and rational functions. And um, because of that, I'll spend quite a bit of time in Desmos trying to grasp these things and remind you of all of the sort of pictures that um, come along with these. Okay. So um, I should uh, say or remind you of what an inverse is, right? So if you've forgotten this uh, terminology here or the definition, um, it was definitely on the midterm exam. And um, what you do in order to determine if something is an inverse, the definition is this, right? So you give me two functions, f and g, and we say that they're inverses of one another. If the following is true, when I compose g with f, or f with g, doesn't matter the order, the output is x, okay? And um, as a reminder, what this means is that we derive that relationship essentially from like sort of running the machine in reverse, right? So if we took that function f and we realized that g was running in the reverse of f, switching its inputs and its outputs, then we'd have to satisfy this formula. And so that's what we took for um, our definition of an inverse. Now, this is not how you actually go about finding the inverse, but it is the definition. And it's incredibly important because in some sense, you can sort of think about F and G as being sort of canceling each other out, right? And in uh, the next chapter, chapter six, we'll introduce two new functions, um, exponential functions and logarithmic functions, and they'll have this relationship between the two of them. And in essence, the way we'll define the logarithm is just to be the inverse of the exponential. So we're gonna see this um, sort of terminology and these ideas coming up um, again. And it's really important that you realize that inverses sort of undo one another, and that's what this equation is saying. Okay, so let's just um, do a quick reminder here of uh, verifying that two things are inverses. 
So we now have two functions. Um, the first one here is f of x, and it takes as input x, it adds 5 to it, and then after it's done adding 5, it divides the whole thing by 3. Um, and then they're giving us the formula for um, a proposed inverse, and this way uh, they've written it as f inverse. And anytime you see this negative 1 up here in the exponent um, for a function, you should not think about it as 1 over f of x. There were several students on the midterm that um, sort of uh, misunderstood the inverse. And so f inverse does not mean 1 over f of x. Uh, again, what it means is that previous uh, definition that we have, right? That when I compose f and f inverse, um, like this, for example, then the output should be x. So I should be able to verify that this is x. And um, likewise, in the opposite order, um, f inverse of f um, should give me an output of x. And there was an example of something along these lines on the midterm where you had to compose two functions and then sort of simplify them. And a lot of examples, um, you could simplify it down to x. So they indeed were um, inverses of one another. But um, here we need to verify that they are uh, indeed inverses of one another. So let's go through um, both directions, okay? And what we'll do next is f inverse of f of x. And again, to verify that they're actually inverses or to show that they're inverses, like this question is asking us for this exercise, we've got to show that this is equal to f and we've got to show that this is equal to x. Okay, so um, let's sort of remind ourselves of how that works in this case. So your first step when doing a composition like this um, is to go to the sort of the most inner function, right? That's this one that's being sort of plugged into the f. And you take that formula there, that f inverse, and you write down um, what it's equal to, right? So they're giving you that this f inverse is 3x minus 5. So here we'll just write down 3x minus 5, and we'll plug it right into the input of the function f. Right? So we're taking the formula for the inverse and plugging it right in. And um, now what we can do is just come over to this formula for um, f of x, right? And everywhere that we see an x in this formula, we're going to replace it with 3x minus 5. So I've already replaced basically the left-hand side with 3x minus 5, so you get f of 3x minus 5. And if you replace the right-hand side, um, you're going to get, I'll put it in parentheses, 3x minus 5, and then, um, I'm sorry, what's going on? Plus 5. I should have been a plus, a plus. And then um, we'll subtract the 5 here, and then divide by um, the 3. Okay? And then just to be clear about everything, this is where the input is, right? This is the 3x plus 5 that I'm getting from here. So 3x plus 5. And again, I just misspoke here about the inverse. It's um, 3x. Uh, what am I doing there? Okay. I'm using the wrong formula, guys. Sorry. Let's try it all out again. I apologize for my mistake. So this is 3x minus 5. And then again, we're going to plug it into the formula. Let's actually just make sure that we're using the right formula here and focus on this one. It's x plus 5, right? So we have 3x minus 5 plus the 5 and then divided by the 3. Okay. And then just focusing in again, here is my 3x minus 5. Okay. Sorry about the, the error here. And um, what you should now notice is that this negative 5 undoes this 5. So this is the same thing as 3x over 3. And then this 3 will cancel out with this 3, and you get back x. Okay, so indeed, um, we have this property that f of f inverse is equal to x. Okay, um, but if we're looking at that definition um, a little more carefully, we should also um, compute this value up here as well. Okay, so let's go through and verify that this is also equal to x. And hopefully we'll see the difference um, between the two of them. So this is going to be f inverse. And then now we're going to plug in that formula for f of x, which um, is x plus 5 over 3. So x plus 5 over 3, that's just exactly what f of x is. And then everywhere that we see an x and x inverse, so that would be uh, here and here, we're going to replace it with that x plus 5 over 3. Okay, so this is going to be um, 3 times x plus 5 over 3, and then um, minus r5, okay? So let me go ahead and jump here. And I'm going to erase this one because we're sort of focused on this one up here. 
The purpose of this computation that I was erasing was just showing that that composition is equal to x. And um, up here, you'll notice that now instead of the 5s canceling first, it's the 3s that cancel. And we're left with x plus 5 minus 5. Now the plus 5 and the minus 5, that's just 0. So this indeed is also equal to x. Okay. And um, we verified or we've showed that f and f inverses are inverses of each other. So this is how you'll check um, if you're just given the formulas, you don't have any graphing calculator to graph or anything like that. But just as a quick reminder, let me go ahead and show you um, what this means in terms of a uh, graph and um, remind you of that process. Okay, so our function f of x in this case was x plus 5 over 3. And x plus 5 over 3 is just a line with slope 1 third and y intercept of 5 over 3. Um, and so you get this line here in red, okay? And um, what we want to do is reflect it across the line y equals x. Okay, and let me put this in a different color so that you can see it sort of a slightly different color and also as a dotted line. Okay, so here we're going to take that line in red and we're going to reflect it around the line in green. And when we reflect it around the line in green, the, the sort of what ends up happening is that um, the x values and the y values are replaced, right? So they swap roles. And just as a reminder here, for example, this point right here at 10, 5, when we swap it out, will become the point 5, 10. So we should expect there to be a point up here in whatever the inverse is. And um, we had a formula for that inverse. Uh, we were saying that it was y equals 3x minus 5. And I'm not going to put f inverse here just because Desmos um, we'll have a little bit of trouble messing with um, inverse functions, but you'll notice here that indeed we do get a point right here at 510, right? So this point got swapped up to over here. This point stays at the same spot because it's actually on the line 2525 five, or 2.5, 2.5, and so on and so forth, okay? So what's happening when we're computing the inverse is graphically we're reflecting along that line um, y equals x. And um, one other piece that we need to know is that if when we do this reflection, um, if we want to end up with something that really is a function that we can write down a formula for, then the function we start with has to be one-to-one. Um, -one. In other words, has to pass the horizontal line test. And indeed, in this case, if you look at horizontal lines, you can sort of see them out here in the grid, they intersect that line in red in at most one spot. So this indeed is one-to-one, -one, and therefore there will be um, an inverse. Okay, so that's just um, a little bit of a reminder of, you know, an example of an inverse and how to check if it satisfies the definition. And um, again, remember what we're sort of verifying here when we do these computations is that uh, the function sort of undo one another, right? So f inverse undoes f and f undoes f inverse. Okay, so um, let's continue on. And we're going to have to sort of think a little more carefully about domain um, coming up. But before we do that, let's just sort of remind ourselves of the process that we used on the exam to actually compute the inverse of something. So here's a function, um, 5 times x cubed plus 1. Uh, it's a polynomial of degree 3. And we would like to compute its inverse, right, a formula for the inverse. And before we do anything, um, we should at the very least verify that it's one-to-one. -one. Now, on an exam, if they're just asking you explicitly compute the inverse, um, you can sort of be sure that we're assuming that the inverse exists. But um, if you're just confronted with a function like this, you may or may not know if it passes the horizontal line test. So let's go ahead and graph this one and just sort of look and verify that indeed it does pass the horizontal line test. Because there are instances where we'll be interested in an inverse, but it won't pass the horizontal line test. So in this case, we're looking at the function 5 times x cubed plus 1. Okay, and you can see that function um, here in red. And if you draw a horizontal line, um, and you can see those horizontal lines, each horizontal line just intersects the graph in at most one spot. And you might be sort of worried about this little spot where it flattens out, but as you zoom in closer and closer, you'll find that for every single horizontal line, it intersects the graph in just one spot, okay? So indeed, we do have a function that is 
one to one. And if we were just interested in the graph, we could sort of just put this uh, line y equals x here and then just rotate everything, okay? Just reflecting, for example, this point here, 0, 2, will get reflected to the point 2, 0, and then sketch our graph. And we did some examples where we were, uh, where we were sketching the graph of our function. But again, my point here is that we really need to be sure that our function indeed is one-to-one. -one. And in this case, we saw, you know, just from a graph that indeed it is. Um, but there's no sort of guarantee, right? There's no sort of guarantee here that um, it will be. Okay, so um, I'm going to give everybody a moment to try and find the inverse. And then once you um, have found the inverse, go ahead and uh, type in your formula. And um, you could just use cube root or cube or something like that um, in the chat box if you need to type in the cube root of something. Or even to the power of one-third. That would be a better way. That's how I'm going to do it on Desmos. So cube roots are going to come in here. Just as a reminder here, you start out by replacing f of x um, with y, and then you swap the role of x and y. And this new graph is just the reflection along that line y equals x, right? So when I swap the role of x and y, I get the, uh, the inverse graph. Now to get the function, I have to solve this for y. Okay, so um, it looks like a lot of people were on the right track here, so let's go ahead and finish this off. Um, one thing that um, I noticed on the midterm was that a lot of people were definitely on the right track, so they were doing the right setup here, but the part that they think they struggled with the most was sort of completing the steps and correctly solving for what. Well. So um, I'll be focused a little bit here on how you go through those steps, especially for a rational function um, when we have to use the distributive law. Um, but here we're just going to be trying to isolate the y. So we'll subtract 1 from both sides. And we get x minus 1 is equal to 5 times y cubed. Uh, you'll then divide both sides by 5. So you get x minus 1 over 5 is equal to y cubed. And then you'll want to undo that um, power of 3. Okay? So this is where you'll take the cube root of both sides of the expression. And um, you should be sort of asking yourself, do you need a plus or minus or not? And um, in this case, the answer is no, because it's an odd power, right? If you have an odd power, you can take the cube root of a negative number or a positive number. So that's fine, right? But if it was an even power there, like a power of four or a power of two, you would indeed need to put a plus or minus. But here we don't need to put a plus or minus. And um, when we undo this uh, power of three here on the right-hand side, we just get y. So on this side, we get the cube root of x minus 1 over 5. Okay, and so we've successfully solved for y, and so we can say now that f inverse of x is equal to the cube root of x minus 1 over 5. And um, this would be the formula of this cubic here being reflected around that line y equals x. So um, let's just go back to Desmos for a moment and actually... Um, you know, visualize this and see um, that happening. So again, here we're going to reflect along that line y equals x, and we're getting a formula of y equals the cube root of x minus 1 uh, divided by 5. And here, uh, it's a little bit hard in Desmos to do um, cube roots necessarily, so I'm just going to raise it to the power of 1 third because that's a little bit easier. And we should all know that a power of one-third, that rational exponent, is the same thing as a cube root. And um, here, indeed, you can see that um, we have made a mistake. Ah, I see our mistake. Anybody see what it is? What's wrong with our initial function? So you'll notice there's no symmetry here, right? Like, like if we got this as our answer, there should be, yeah, okay, so Jordan is seeing that indeed we got the right formula for the inverse, but we just didn't type in the correct function up here. It should be f of x cubed. It's not plus 2, but instead, I think, in the problem, it should have been plus 1. And indeed, there we are, right? So now you can see that, in fact, there is this symmetry around that line, um, y equals x. And just so everybody can see, let me bring back up um, that slide so you can see it is plus 1, okay? Okay. 
So um, here, when we graph it, you can see that this point here at 0, 1 comes over to this point at 1, 0. This point stays at the same point because it has the same x and y value. Yeah, Alan, I was sort of concerned too. I was like, no, I did some sort of algorithm wrong. But then, uh, you know, sometimes you just make a little typo like that at the very beginning. It's sort of an easy thing to, to write down the wrong number. Um, okay. And, and I'll just say that um, a lot of the times when I do answer questions from you guys, it's often just like, did you write down the right number at the beginning? And uh, like, you know, nine times out of ten, that's the issue. Okay. So just jumping back to um, our uh, slides here, we can see that we get um, our formula. And because the graph was one-to-one, -one, we should be able to actually solve for y, right? If the graph wasn't one-to-one, -one, we'd run into an issue. We'd get like a plus or a minus here, or there would be some issue where we couldn't actually solve for um, the value of y. So um, that's a really good example. Now, one other thing that you should remember is that if I look at the domain of this, because it's a polynomial, it's just all real numbers. And then if you sort of remember what that graph looked like, the range was also from negative infinity to infinity. So um, when you come over here to the inverse function, um, the inverse function, the domain and the range swap, right? Because we switched x and y, the domain of your original function becomes the range of the inverse, and the range of your original function becomes the domain of um, the inverse. And so here, this uh, inverse has a domain in a range of all real numbers, negative infinity and infinity. But again, when this thing is even, we're going to run into um, a little more problems, okay? So let's um, continue on with uh, a tutorial now, okay? So what do we do when we don't have a function that is one-to-one? In other words, graphically, the function does not pass the horizontal line test. And so there won't be a way to solve for the inverse function. Well, um, you may still be interested in undoing that function or an inverse for that function, but you have to be a bit more careful. And this is what's meant by that second learning objective. And again, I'll just sort of qualify this one more time with like in infinity, there's only one or two questions along these lines. But we still need to, to talk about it because it's important. Um, here, we're going to be given a polynomial function, and we're going to sort of assume that the polynomial function is not one-to-one. -one. If it's one-to-one, -one, you just do exactly what it is that you normally would do, like we did in the previous example. But let's suppose we have a function that is not one-to-one. -one. So your first step is going to be to restrict the domain of the function to an interval where indeed it is one-to-one. -one. Okay. So we're just going to have to remove part of the input and guarantee that we are one-to-one. -one. And I'll give you an example of how to do that here in a moment. And there's a nice way to do it in Desmos. Um, and then we just go through the same process we just talked about. So first step, replace your f of x with y. You then swap x and y, you interchange them. And again, that's that reflecting across the line y equals x. So graphically, this third step just means reflect along that line y equals x. Um, and because you guaranteed that you were passing the um, horizontal line tester that you're one-to-one, -one, this thing will then be uh, something that's a function. And because it's a function, you can solve for y. And um, you'll rename the function f inverse. So that's sort of the last step that we were talking about. And then we have to be really careful, okay? So in the final step, we need to make sure that um, we take into account our domain restriction. Because what's going to often happen is in step four, we're going to be um, confronted with a choice. So often there'll be like a plus or a minus, or there'll be two choices for the equation, and we have to determine are we going to take the positive route or the negative route. And determining which one we take is really based off of what restriction we made. And um, the restriction could be sort of arbitrary, right? It's not like there's some fixed rule for obtaining a restriction. It just sort of depends on um, the context of the problem. And in many cases, for example, at Affinity, they'll restrict the domain to just some specific value arbitrarily and um, you're supposed to use that information. Now, it's incredibly important because, for example, if you um, are going to study like trigonometry or take a course where um, trigonometry will play a role, many of those functions are not one-to-one, -one, and um, you'll have to do this same process there as well, right, where you try to restrict your domain so that you get something that is indeed invertible. Okay, so the only extra piece here in this how-to is to take into account the restricted domain 
so that you are one to one. So what do I mean by that? Let's actually um, talk about an example. So here is an example of a function f of x is equal to x minus 4 squared, that is not one-to-one. -one. So let me just graph it here in Desmos. Remember, it's just a quadratic that's been moved to the right by four units. Um, that's what that minus four uh, does. So here, we're going to do x minus four raised to the power of two. And so we get this nice um, parabola here that's been moved two units um, to the right. And you'll notice that, for example, if you look at the horizontal line here at y is equal to 5, it, it hits the graph in two spots. So this thing is certainly not one-to-one. -one. And if we were to try and reflect it across um, the x-axis, right, so if I were to um, replace f of x uh, with just x and x with y, so that first step, then um, what we would end up with is something that does not pass the vertical line test. So if we just swap x and y on something that doesn't pass the horizontal line test, we don't end up with something that's a function. So here, um, we need to really think carefully about a way in order to make this function in red one-to-one. -one. And um, the way that you do that is to restrict the domain. And like I said, it's sort of arbitrary. Um, here in this example that we're looking at, there are two domain restrictions that we'll look at. The first is restricting to values that are bigger than or equal to 4, so the right half of the parabola. And the second is restricting to um, values that are less than or equal to 4. So this comma here and then um, saying x is greater than or equal to 4 or less than or equal to 4 just means that we're now restricting our domain. We're not including all real numbers, just these numbers that are either bigger than or equal to 4 or less than or equal to 4 for the second one. Okay, so in Desmos, there's a really cool way to do this. So let me go ahead and... Um, pop that into Desmos for you and show you how you restrict the domain. So if you just add some curly brackets here in uh, Desmos, you can then restrict your domain. And here we'll say x is greater than or equal to 4 first. So this is just telling us don't plug in anything, any values of x that are less than 4. And what happens is we just get the right half of that parabola, right? So the smallest x value is here, and then we go on to the right. And you can see now that indeed we do get a um, function which satisfies the horizontal line test. In other words, it is one-to-one, -one, and so it will have an inverse. And when it does have an inverse, we can swap the role of x and y and solve for y uniquely. But um, we'll have to keep in mind the domain restriction here in order to do that. And then the other one that we were interested in was uh, in part b when x is less than or equal to 4. So let's do a modification that, here is x is less than or equal to 4, and you can see now that we get um, the function on the left-hand side, there in red, okay? So um, we'll have to take that into account when we're solving for the inverses in A and the inverse in B. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off with A, and um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys um, try to find the formula first, and then we'll talk about how we can restrict the domain. Okay, so uh, here, whenever you're done with the formula or finding the steps here, just give me a thumbs up. You don't have to put your answer into um, the chat box, but just give me a thumbs up that you've had enough time to solve for um, the formula for the inverse, and then we'll talk about how the domain plays a role here. Okay, and since I've already written out that function, I'm just going to sort of open up the screen. Okay, so we've got at least one student um, completing it. Okay, so let's go through and um, hopefully give everybody, I've given everybody a chance to start the process, right? So if we were sort of naively thinking it passed the uh, horizontal line test, even though it doesn't, then the steps that we would do is, okay, we would replace the f of x with y. Um, we'd swap the role of x and y. And then we would try to go through and solve for y, okay? 
So we would take the square root of both sides, and when we take the square root of both sides, we have to put a plus or minus. Remember, um, in the last one, we took the cube root of both sides, and we didn't need the plus or minus because that was odd. But here, if we have an even power and we take an even root, we need to add plus or minus to both sides. Okay, and then we can add the 4 um, to both sides of the equation, and it will cancel this negative 4 over here. And we get 4 plus or minus the square root of x is equal to y. And we can see that this is sort of the problem here, right? I mean, this is not a function. Why is it not a function? Well, if I plug in an input, I don't know if the output is plus or minus that value of the square root of x, right? And um, remember, the, the key feature of a function is that for every input, there's one and only one output. And here we're saying we don't know. Is it plus or is it minus? Okay, so this is where the domain restriction is going to be really important, okay? So up here, the first domain restriction in part A was that x was bigger than or equal to 4. Okay? Now, what happens is that this is the domain of the function, and so the domain of the original function will then become the range of the inverse function. And you can sort of see that just by replacing this x with y. So here at this stage, um, i sorry, at this stage down here, this one still should be x is 4, but this is the stage where we flipped the role of x and y, we'll also um, change this x to a y. And what that means is that we're really only considering the case when y is greater than or equal to 4. And this is telling us about the range of the inverse, okay? So here, this is y is greater than or equal to 4. Okay, so again, we've got y is greater than or equal to 4, y is greater than or equal to 4. And this information tells us which of the two to choose. Should we choose the positive or the negative here? If we want y to be bigger than or equal to 4, should we choose the positive value or the negative value? Okay, great. So everybody's sort of seeing that it's got to be positive, right? Because if we chose the negative, it would make it smaller than 4, right? If I take 4 and subtract something, it makes it smaller. But if I add something, it makes it bigger. And so this is telling us that the inverse um, on this restriction is given by this formula. Okay? So, and it depends. It really does depend on what our restriction was. Let's see this graphically and um, see what's going on with our function. So again, we're on the case when x is greater than or equal to 4, so let me just change this back to greater than or equal to. So that's that um, right half side of that parabola. And we just found the formula y is equal to 4 plus the square root of x. Um, and you can see now that we get that black function over there. Um, which is perfectly reflected across the line y equals x. So indeed, we do have the inverse. Um, however, if you were to have chosen the wrong value, the minus, you'll see that it doesn't, in fact, um, reflect this function at all, right? So the red one is not a reflection of that function in black. So the correct choice was the plus. And again, the way that we got that plus value there was just to go through and um, keep track of the domain. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing that in the case when a function is not one-to-one, -one, we need to be really careful about what our domain is, right, when we're trying to look for a potential inverse. So um, if we now switch our attention to the other question, right, so the second one here is now when x is less than or equal to 4, let's talk about how that would change the problem, okay? So now um, we're going to change this piece here to not be greater than, Four, but less than 4. So this means here we would be less than or equal to 4. And that means we're only looking at the left-hand side of that parabola as opposed to the right-hand side. Here we would still have less than or equal to 4. And then now at this step when we swap the role of x and y, um, x is less than or equal to 4 now becomes y is less than or equal to 4. This stays less than or equal to 4. This stays less than or equal to 4. And now that, again, informs our decision. Should we include the positive or the negative? So in this case, it's the negative, and that's because 4 minus something is going to make it smaller. And that will guarantee that the y is smaller than 4. Okay, so here it should be 4 minus the square root of x, and this is now for part b. Okay, so you can see that the formula you get for your answer depends on 
the restricted domain, right? And we have to restrict our domain in order to guarantee the function is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so just coming back one more time, let's now see that. So here we're going to switch now to, again, um, being less than or equal to four, and we get that function in red over there. And if we put a minus here, we can now see that this function in black is um, reflected along that line y equals x. Okay, so um, we need to be really careful about our domains, right? And here it was just an arbitrary restriction on our domain, like the fact that we're taking x to be bigger than or equal to 4 or less than or equal to 4 was just given to us in the problem. Um, now, depending on the situation that you're sort of using, if you're applying this in some, you know, area or solving a word problem or something, uh, the domain restriction may be sort of imposed upon you by the application. But here it's just arbitrary, and we could have picked something like x is bigger than 5 or x is bigger than or equal to 100, just anything that makes the graph one-to-one. -one. Okay, so that was this question about restricting the domain of the function f. Um, on the other hand, we may have to also restrict the domain of the inverse because um, as you solve for the inverse, you may introduce um, more um, solutions than the original function has. And here, this problem is stated a little bit funky. I think this is actually an infinity, so I, I took it directly from infinity to point out that, you know, it says here restrict the domain of the function f of x, but they don't really mean the function f of x. That's already just going to be sort of fixed from the beginning. And the first question I'll ask you here is, what is the domain of um, f of x? But what they're really referring to here in terms of restricting is um, you have to restrict the inverse. Because if you don't restrict the domain of the inverse, you, in fact, don't get um, the correct formula for the inverse. So here, um, we'll sort of be playing the, the same sort of game, but now in reverse of what we saw in the last one. Okay, so again, that first question is, what is the domain of f of x in this case? Okay, so we're interested in the domain of f of x, and we'll also be interested in the range of f of x. And let me at least um, first find them, and then we'll find out why. Okay, so what do you guys get for the domain? Um, and remember, this was the sort of question that was on the midterm, so this is good review for um, the final exam. Well, so the domain is not just going to be just four. Remember, the domain is the whole entire interval. It's everything that you can plug into um, the function. So what values of x can I plug into this function? For example, I can't plug in zero, right? If I plugged in zero, I would get the square root of negative four, and that's a complex number. Um, Alan, you almost have the right idea. Jordan, it's not negative infinity to infinity because you can't plug in zero, for example. Um, I think Gabrielle has the uh, the right answer here, but the endpoint is a little bit off, right? So here, um, we want x minus 4 to be greater than or equal to 0, right? If we're going to find the domain, it's got to be the thing we're taking the square root of is greater than or equal to 0. So that means x is greater than or equal to 4. And then that just tells us that our domain, in this case, is from 4 all the way out to um, infinity. Anything bigger than 4, okay? What about the range? What is the range of this function? What are the possible outputs? And I'll just remind you that it's not negative infinity to infinity because you can never get a negative as an output of this function. This is just the square root, and so the square root is always going to output something that's positive. So what would the range of this function be? Here we've got the domain. What do we get for the range? Maybe it'll be helpful to graph it. So here we're looking at the square root of x minus 4. Um, and Jordan is right on the right track. Just remember that we have to include the 0, because if I plug in 4, 
um, then uh, I can definitely have a value of zero on the y value. And then just as I zoom out, this graph of the square root just keeps going up and up and up, so you go from zero to infinity, okay? So the range now is zero to infinity. Okay, so um, let me write down the function f of x as well, just so we remember what it is, the square root of x minus four. And now I'm just gonna jump to my board because uh, we have enough information to sort of figure some stuff out. Now, the first thing that we should know here is just directly from these two pieces of information here that um, the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function. So we should expect whatever the range of our function is, um, our inverse function that we find to be from four to infinity, and we should expect the domain, whatever it is, of our inverse um, to be from zero to infinity. In other words, whatever our inverse is, we cannot plug in negative values into it, okay? So now that I've said that, go ahead and take this formula and try to solve for f inverse, okay? So we want to find a formula for f inverse of x. And um, once you have it, plug it into um, the chat. Uh, it should be a polynomial, right? It shouldn't be too hard here. It should be a polynomial. And we'll see sort of an issue here where we have to really think about the domain. So what's that formula? Okay, great. So um, everybody's sort of getting the right answer here. So we get y is equal to the square root of x minus four. We swap the role of x and y. And then we solve for um, y. We square both sides. And then we solve for the y. So we add four to both sides and we get x squared plus four. But this is a problem. We can't just box our answer here. And let me show you why. If we go over to the graph and we actually graph this thing that we just talked about, y equals x squared plus 4, um, we get too much, okay? You'll notice here in our graph that we're getting the left-hand side of this parabola, and, and the function that we're ending up with doesn't even pass the horizontal line test. So this is not quite the inverse. And what we need to do is we need to include just a little bit more information. What's the other information we need to include? We need to know that the domain is bigger than or equal to zero. So this formula should also have sort of a comma here that says x is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay? And um, here in um, Desmos, we can add that in, right? So remember, we can add a domain restriction that x is bigger than or equal to um, zero. And indeed, when we do that, um, we get something that reflects along that line, y equals x, okay? So um, here, it's not enough to just um, sort of do this process where we solve for the f inverse. It seems really straightforward and you get this polynomial. The problem is if you write it without any restriction, this has a domain of all real numbers, okay? So when you're finding the inverse of a radical, the range of the original function becomes the domain of the inverse. And um, we have to take that into account. So that's a pretty good um, example of the situation. Um, Alan, I would just say, you know, I'm writing it like a comma here, but that's not standard. It would probably be better to just write it as a sentence. F inverse is equal to x squared plus 4, and the domain is the interval from 0 to infinity. But this is sort of a shorthand way of putting the comma. Like, affinity won't um, accept that, okay? Um, Desmos does like that sort of thing, but affinity is not, um, not going to be a good way to input your answer. Um, okay, and like I said, there's not really a whole lot of questions in affinity about the domain restriction, but I think this is really a good time since we're reviewing a lot of these ideas to sort of see some of the problems that arise um, with domain and range. Okay, so the next one here is, um, doesn't have anything to do with domain or range, but I just wanted to do this one because um, we had something similar on the midterm, and some students really ran into the algebra, right? So the process here of switching the x and the y and sort of finding the inverse, everybody like had that down really well, but the parts where people really sort of messed up, um, if they did, 
were in the algebra. And this is an example of sort of one that's um, a little more tough. So let me go through this one. And then um, once we're done with this, we have one last um, example to work out. So I'm going to go through this one a little bit more quickly because, like I said, um, the only issue here is um, the algebra. Okay. So here, you'll get y is equal to x plus 3 over x minus 2. Now, one cool thing here is that you should expect in the graph, let's just sort of think about some of the pieces of the graph, um, the degrees are the same, so there should be a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1, right? So there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1, and then there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2 because the denominator there um, is 0. So we've got a horizontal and a vertical asymptote. Now, I'm not even going to graph anything more than that. I just want to point out that just looking at the graph, we should sort of just know that from um, the expression there. But here's our uh, formula. I've replaced f as x with y. Let's swap x and y. And um, what we want to do now is um, try to solve for the y. And this is um, one step that most students got, but some of you sort of forgot about this process here. When you have a fraction and you're trying to isolate the y, the first thing you want to do is clear out the denominator, right? So the denominator here is y minus 2, so you'll multiply both sides by y minus 2. And a lot of students did this, but the next step is the one that on the midterm um, people really sort of floundered on. Now, a lot of people wrote x, y, and then minus 2. But remember, it's y minus 2 times x, so we have to distribute this x through. So this is really x times y minus 2x is equal to y plus 3. Okay? And now that we have all of the fractions cleared out, we can move everything with a y to one side, everything without a y to the other. So this y needs to come to this side, and this 2x needs to go to the other side. So I'm just adding 2x and subtracting y from both sides. And the goal of that computation was to put everything with a y on one side. And the reason why is that now we can factor out this y. So I factor that y out, and I'm left with y times x minus 1 is equal to 3 plus 2x. And then my final step is to divide by the x minus 1. And then finally write out my answer as f inverse is equal to 3 plus 2x over x minus 1. And here's something cool that you can now see from this one. If you look at this uh, formula here, um, and you think about what the horizontal asymptote of the inverse is, well, the degrees are the same, and the ratio is 2 over 1. So this vertical asymptote at x equals 2 will then become a horizontal asymptote in the inverse when we reflect it um, along the line uh, y is equal to x. And this horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 then just gets reflected to a um, vertical asymptote at 1. So we can sort of see that information showing back up in the formula um, as well. Okay, but again, I wanted to point out this step here because a lot of people really, um, this was the part they sort of floundered on, I'm sorry, from here to here, right, distributing. So make sure that um, you go through that process of distributing that guy. And um, we should, again, be very careful about whether or not this is one-to-one, -one, but if you do graph it, it turns out to be one-to-one. -one. Okay, um, and then, Here's one last question because it's probably the hardest sort of thing that you'll see on um, Adfinity, and it's going to require us to complete the square. So I just want to show you this one so that you have a good guide um, to this question because it's kind of tough to solve for y. Okay. And um, here they're restricting our domain to x is greater than uh, 0 uh, in order to make our life a little bit easier. Okay. So here... That formula was y equals the square root of x squared plus 5x, and then we are guaranteeing that x is greater than 0. So we're introducing this um, domain restriction. And um, again, what we're going to do is swap the role of x and y. So here's x, and it's going to be equal to y squared plus 5 times y. And um, we also should swap this out. So this then goes from x being greater than 0 to y being greater than 0. And that's because the domain turns into the range of the inverse function. Okay, so now we'll go through this and try and solve for y, and we'll use this to determine when we need the plus or minus. Okay, so let's get rid of the square root by squaring both sides. 
and we end up with this expression here. And I'm not going to write the y is greater than zero. Just assume it's coming down along um, the right for us. And what you should sort of focus on in order to solve this is that the right-hand side is a quadratic, okay? And we can complete the square. So to complete the square here, you should take b over 2 squared. Um, and in this case, the b is 5. So this should be 5 over 2 squared. In other words, 25 over 4. So I'm going to add 25 over 4 to both sides, and I get x squared plus 25 over 4 is equal to y squared plus 5y plus 25 over 4. And again, the purpose of that is that I'm completing the square on the right-hand side. So this will factor, right? Um, this is always going to factor into um, whatever the variable is plus b over 2. The b over 2 in this case is 5 over 2, and then the whole thing is squared. So it's a perfect square on that side. And on this side, we get x squared plus 25 over 4. Now to undo this square, we take the square root of both sides, and we should get a plus or minus. So we get x squared plus 25 over 4 um, is equal to y plus 5 over 2. And then finally, we'll subtract this 5 over 2 to the other side in order to get y is equal to negative 5 over 2 plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 25 over 4. And now we have to go back to this. Right? If I want to guarantee that y is bigger than 0, should I keep the positive or the negative? Um, and yeah, it's got to be the positive, because if it were negative, these would both be negative and it would be less than 0. But we have to have that y is greater than 0, so we need to keep the positive version. And then that tells us the formula. Um, for the inverse. And um, because I'm over by one minute, um, I'm not going to actually go through and graph this in Desmos, but I invite you to graph this in and you'll see that it corresponds to the domain restriction being um, greater than zero. Okay? So again, these restrictions are telling you if you choose the positive or the negative when you're looking for that inverse. Um, and that's it for today. So um, have a nice day, guys. And um, remember, there's only one section this week in um, Desmos.